never assume you you have the only correct answer. And I've caught myself in that situation where I was dead set on the solution to whatever problem we were facing at that moment. And it was because I thought, you know, I absolutely know this. This is easy. This is firefighter one stuff. And it turned out I was completely wrong. Enchanted Sky Media. Media. the Enchanted Sky Studios in Prescott, Arizona, this is Code 3, the Firefighters Podcast, hosted by award-winning journalist Scott Orr. Code 3 features interviews with leading members of the fire service, discussing firefighting strategies, tactics, and other topics you need to know more about. Now, here's Scott. That's right, and I will not let Parkinson stop me. Thank you for joining me again here on Code 3. This is the show for and about firefighters. We're informing and entertaining members of the fire service, just like you, from coast to coast. You don't have to be the senior man at your station to have learned some valuable lessons. The things we learn that improve how we do our jobs sometimes come from keeping an open mind and asking lots of questions. My guest today condensed a few concepts he picked up that way into a Firehouse.com article. Charlie Evans has fewer than five years in the fire service, but he wrote about four lessons he's learned as a firefighter in Lynchburg, Virginia. And joining me now to talk about what he's found is Charlie Evans. Welcome to Code 3. Hey, thanks. I'm glad to be here. So what prompted you to come up with this list of ideas? I had just been thinking about them. I've only, I've only been in this fire in the fire service for about four years. August will be four years. And I've kind of committed myself to being a sponge and to trying to learn as much as I can from my senior coworkers, my officers, and even other fire departments. Because I, I don't think there is any one clear-cut, correct way to do something. And I, I think the more opportunities you have to broaden your perspective in this job that is constantly changing and full of surprises and endless possibilities. I think it's really important to absorb and learn as much as you can and be able to view everything from many different perspectives. So you had four suggestions of things that made life easier as a firefighter, and we're going to go through them. Number one was Control what you can control because this job doesn't offer a lot of room for much else. With that in mind, tell me about your visit to Station 1 in Cary, North Carolina. I went down there just to try to get some perspective from a different fire department. And anyway, so I was down at Station 1 and they, they were having an open house and the, uh, the tones dropped at the station. And before the dispatcher could even say which trucks needed to respond i saw everybody jump up from their seats and sprint out to the bay floor and uh so you know i followed them out there naturally and everybody was throwing their all their gear and somebody from the station office yelled out over the intercom hey it's just the truck company and at that point the guys on the engine started to take their gear back off and i looked over at the captain and i said wow that was that was really something and he said the only thing that you can ever control in a response is how quickly you get to the truck. He said, you never know what traffic's going to be like, or if you're going to get a red light somewhere that won't change with your Opticom, or you never know what kind of issues are out there when you're responding. So you need to, you need to take control of what you do have uh, at the station. And I, I don't know. I was just really impressed by that because I've never seen that before. This leads to a bigger philosophical concept, which is that in all things we should control the parts that we can because there's only so much we can control, for instance, at a fire ground. Oh, absolutely. That really plays into communication. And um, when you when the department has a a standard for communicating on the fire ground, when they have when they've gone over it, when they practice it, and then after a response to a any kind of incident, be it a structure fire or a vehicle incident, whatever, when you do that debrief and you discuss how the communication aspect went, if you have that part down pat and you can control that, it helps the entire scene go a lot more smoothly. Next, you said 
be prepared to work no matter which sea you're riding. You learned a lesson that you've started to apply when you rode in the back seat of a rescue company one day. What happened there? Oh, yeah. So we were actually, it was at shift change, and I had just gotten to the station, and uh, they told me, hey, you're going to be on the back of the rescue, and the tone dropped for a structure fire, and I'm, I'm throwing my gear on real quick, and I look up, and the driver was putting his gear on, and that's something I had never done before, and I, I normally drive the engine at my station, and I thought that was a really, that was a really cool idea that he was getting dressed. He was taking advantage of the time that the rest of the crew was using to get dressed. That's true. Otherwise, he'd just be sitting in the seat waiting to roll out. Exactly. And I, that's been my position several times on, on calls where I'm just sitting in the driver's seat waiting. So I did actually catch some flack for that uh, from the driver that I mentioned that did, does not get his pants on. <laughs> he he uh, thought it was funny that I called him out, and I didn't mean to call him out. It, you know, it, things work differently for each driver and for each firefighter, but it, that that's what I found works best for me now. So I get my at least my bunker pants on every time we have a structure fire. And that's got to be an interesting habit to get into because 99 out of 100 incidents, you're going to be running the pumps and you're not going to be going into a building, but there could be that one time you're needed. Exactly. And that my philosophy is that that one time is really what you need to be prepared for and, for, and training for. I guess you're saying it's preparedness for the just-in-case moment. Exactly. Yeah, you never know, especially in this job, what you're going to run into. And it's best to plan for the worst case scenario and hope for the best. If you like Code 3, you'll love the Code 3 Bull Session. It's more discussion with our guests on any topic. Sometimes it's serious. Sometimes it's not so serious. But it's only available to patrons of Code 3. Find out what you've been missing. Go to Code3Podcast.com slash support. Pledge just $10 a month to support Code 3, and you'll get immediate access to all the bull sessions in our library and future interviews as we post them. Become a patron today, support the show, and get access to the Code 3 bull sessions. All right, number three was to use hydrants as landmarks when you're responding, no matter what the call is. Hydrants make useful markers even when there's no fire, don't they? Yeah, and it's funny. The guy that was the ALS partner um, I was riding with that day, he was actually, he's newer than I am. And, you know, you kind of get in that mindset, oh, the new guy, he doesn't really know as much or whatever. But when he, he, went, he mentioned using the hydrant as a landmark for this house, and I just thought that was genius. Because it, it offers all kinds of opportunities for learning and for knowing your territory a little better. And that, that helped me when I am driving the engine. I know exactly where that hydrant is going to be now because I remember that house. I remember that unique mailbox or that weird street light or whatever. But it, it'll trigger that in my memory, um, pulling up to that house or anywhere in that area for a potential structure fire. And so I, I try to integrate that now into responding on EMS calls or something that's not fire related just so that we have a better idea of where those hydrants are going to be. Do you find that people responding on EMS runs typically ignore hydrants or is this sort of a habit that you keep in mind at all times? It's something that's growing. Now see in my department and many departments we're running fire and EMS and uh, we rotate from engine or truck to the medic unit and it's a constant rotation and I think when you use the medic unit and the calls that you're running on the medic unit as an opportunity to learn your territory and to learn just the houses in your area and the streets in your area, it really lends itself to better operations on the engine or truck company. And I'll point out, sort of foreshadowing the last point, that if you happen to be first on the scene and you see something's up with a hydrant, you can let the first in engine know about it before they even arrive. Yeah, absolutely. At, at least in my department, if if a if we're responding to a structure fire, normally um, somebody often on the rescue will call out over the radio, "Hey, first do engine. There's a hydrant at the intersection of Blank Street and this street." Um, and I think having that overall picture of what you're coming up to, um, as far as what is going to be standard, you know, the hydrant, the road, everything. If you have that picture ahead of time before you arrive on scene that really gives you it goes back to actually the first point of controlling what you can can control and if you have that 
understanding of what you're what you know will be there if you know the constants in that area when you're arriving on scene you have a little bit more control of the scene no matter what's happening with the structure fire or whatever the incident may be and if it should be the case if you happen to catch the fact there's a vehicle blocking the hydrant you could let them know in advance also which would give them a few extra seconds to prepare absolutely yeah and that that i think that goes back to the communication and communicating as soon as you know something as soon as you see it so that you can better prepare everybody else on scene your last point was to use every call as a chance to pre-plan and i think this point makes the idea that pre-planning is in a task just for company officers and that as we were just saying a second ago you can help when things get confusing if you've paid attention in the past Tell me about this one. There was a structure fire call with an address that everybody knew. Everybody knows that road. It's a very busy road in the city. It's in the middle of the city. Everybody passes it no matter what station you're located at. At some point, you're on that road. And the address comes out, and everybody responds as normal. And after one or two minutes, all the trucks all basically at the same time start talking to dispatch, asking, did, did you get the address right? Do you know something about this house? Do we have any notes on that location? Turns out they couldn't find the driveway. The driveway driveway was actually between two buildings, if I remember correctly, and it was really hard to find. Luckily, a paramedic who it normally rides in that area um, was at the hospital, and he overheard it on the radio, and he was able to get up on the radio and tell them, hey, it's actually between these two buildings, and you ha- it's going to be tight. You're not going to be able to get many trucks in there and you also need to pay special attention because there's a low hanging electrical wire and only a medic unit can fit under there to even get to this house and had he not done that had he not had the forethought and known about that from previous calls that he runs at that address all the time that could have been catastrophic if we had a truck company try to fit in there or an engine and just hook that wire that could have really escalated the situation and so that would be the essence of being a team player to say i've been here let me help you instead of just saying yeah they'll figure it out for themselves when they arrive (laughs) absolutely i totally agree with four years of experience what is the one most important thing you've learned so far oof that's a that's a tough one i would say to never assume you 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 have the only correct answer i think i I, i've and i've caught myself in that situation where i was dead set on the solution to whatever problem we were facing at that moment and it was because i thought you know i absolutely know this this is easy this is firefighter one stuff and it turned out i was completely wrong so i think in this job you know you have an opportunity to be really you you have the opportunity to be prideful and i think just a small ounce of humility in this in this profession allows you to be more successful in the long run. All right, Charlie Evans, thanks very much for being with me on Code 3 today. Thank you so much for having me. And we put some information about ideas that can make us better on the job on our website at code3podcast.com slash lessons. Check it out. All right, as always, that's it. That's all for this edition of Code 3. I want to hear what you think of this show. Email me, scott at code3podcast.com. Thank you for listening. I'll be back next time with more, and I hope you'll join me. I'm Scott Orr, and until then, stay safe. Code 3 is a production of Enchanted Sky Media. To contact us, get more information on today's topic, or subscribe to the podcast, go to Code3Podcast.com.